I just want to share something with you, an experience that I had last night. I had someone that left a message on my Facebook because they saw one of my videos and they wanted to talk to me on the phone. So that's all fine. You know, if anybody wants to contact me, you know, you can email me, go to my Facebook, comment on the videos. You know, there's a million ways to contact me. You know, and I'm fine with talking on the phone. But so this guy said that he really liked the last video that I did talking about um, you know lordship salvation easy believism saying how easy believism people will use my yoke is easy and they'll try to make that say that you know salvation is easy you know they'll try to say that putting on the yoke is easy basically is how they're trying to interpret that or something but you know he he, he likes my stance on lordship salvation and that's good and he said you know there's not a lot of people that understand that right and you know I agree there aren't but uh, he asked what I thought about John MacArthur. Some people have said this, and I may have mentioned John MacArthur before, but I do think that he's really good on the subject of Lordship Salvation. He's basically one of the you know main pioneers of it that's made it popular. Uh, you know, with his book, The Gospel According to John, or Jesus According to Jesus, sorry, uh, which I actually haven't read, and I mean I've watched some of his videos on it, but anyways. You know, John MacArthur is a Calvinist, and I'm totally against Calvinism, right? So, uh, anyway, I talked to this guy, and uh, there's a few things that I have to critique, critique about talking to him. And so the first one was that, uh, you know, he used the modern Bible versions and stuff. He used the ESV and so, you know, I'm not superstitious. I believe that the King James Bible is the Word of God. It's a preserved Word of God. It's a perfect translation and all that. Uh, but, you know, he read from other versions. And, you know, I'm fine with that. If, you know, if other people, you know, read other versions and stuff, I eventually I would talk to him about it. Uh, but, you know, it wasn't, I wasn't just going to jump all over him, you know, instantly on that one. But, uh, anyway... You know, unless he read something that, that specifically, you know, really changed something, uh, which, you know, the, the ESV does in parts. You know, they, it removes verses and stuff. So that's one of my main gripes about the modern versions. But there's a lot of other problems there. But anyway, so the first thing is, you know, this guy is using modern Bible versions. Didn't really say anything about that one. But the second thing is that he goes to uh, church buildings. He's actually said that he had his own evangelism class. And uh, so I was like, whoa. And it ended, up, it ended up coming to him saying that I need to go to church buildings. And, you know, so I, don't, I really don't appreciate that. I'm very much against church buildings. I left them. I have a section on a website dedicated to, you know, the problems with them. And he said that, you know, you need to go there to be accountable. And I have a page of accountability. How, you know, you have to be accountable to God. Uh, going to a building doesn't really make anybody accountable to anybody. Um, but, you know, so that really bothered me. So I did say something about that. You know, he was talking about how his church has elder boards and, he was talking about a senior pastor and stuff, and I was like, well, was Paul a member of an elders board? Or was Paul a senior pastor and stuff? And, and you know, he said that, you know, well, Paul did appoint, appoint people to be elders and things like this. And, you know, and I said, yeah, do you know where uh, somebody who Paul appointed is? You know, I'd, I'd go to that church building if I knew for sure that Paul appointed that person, right? But, uh... You know, so I'm totally against church buildings. I'm not going to go to a church building ever again, you know, unless it's for some other reason. Like, I don't know. I don't know why I would go there uh, to infiltrate or something like that. But I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to attend a church building uh, because I think that that's what the Bible teaches, that we need to do as good Christians or whatever. That's absolutely false. And just to stick on that note, I was thinking something the other day, too, about how these church buildings talk about, you know, a lot of them teach tithing, which is completely false. Or they have a big emphasis on giving money. And I was thinking about how I've heard multiple churches say that if you want the, the building, if you want to come to the building, you know, we have the light bill to pay and things like this. Like, we need your money. 
And, you know, they want to justify giving and everything by, by saying, you know, the verse where Paul said, you know, gather money for the saints, right? Take up a collection. But were they, uh, did they have electricity back then? You know, <laughs> was that collection going towards light bills and things like that? Uh, no, it wasn't. Okay. Oh, but that was back then, but now we need these luxuries and stuff. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, you know, what about the Amish? They go to church buildings, and I'm not saying that the Amish are Christians or anything like that, but I mean, they, they don't have electricity. You know, um, no, you don't need to pay a light bill, okay? You can just meet outside. People can be in your homes where you're already paying the light bill on your own and all these other things. It's all a bunch of nonsense, a big waste of money, a waste of time, tons of false doctrine. It's an unbiblical system where it's, it's nothing but entertainment. It's one guy running the show and it's just, it's nonsense. It's all a bunch of garbage and trash and I'll never go to a church building ever again. It's not biblical. If it was biblical, I'd be going. Trust me. Okay, so... Anyway, so this guy, he was talking to me, he agrees with me on Lordship Salvation, that's good, but he's into the modern Bible versions, he goes to church buildings, and it's funny how all these things connect together, but he, he, he talked to me about evangelism, and he kind of gave me a little sermon, and I took some notes on it, and there were some good things, and we discussed some things, we started talking about apologetics and whatnot, and we were talking about different, uh, you know, apologists, or I don't know how you want to say that, but Anyways, I think that I guess I kind of led into what happened, but I was asking about this guy named Cy Ten, uh, you know, who, who, who debates and whatnot, but uh, he's a Calvinist, and there's a lot of problems with the way he debates and everything. And he agreed that he thought, you know, some things that he said was wrong. One of the reasons why I don't like the guy is because of things that I heard, like an atheist asked him a question, like, why did God allow all these people to be killed in the Old Testament or a command for them to be killed or whatnot? And Sai so Ten's like, well, that's easy. God chooses to hate some and he chooses to love others or whatever. That's absolutely ridiculous. That makes God to be a monster. That's the way that the Calvinist thinks. And it's perfectly reasonable, you know, for atheists to reject that God <laughs> because that's not the God of the Bible, okay? God doesn't choose to hate some, choose to love others, okay, like that. Um, so, anyway, so then I ended up asking this guy, and I was thinking, you know, he likes John MacArthur. He said he was one of his favorite teachers. And so I said, are you a Calvinist? Do you hold to a reform position? That's what I asked him. And yeah, he was. And so we debated about that for a little while. But he brought up a couple of verses. I didn't know how to respond immediately. I had to think about some things. And I still am. And, you know, I've been talking about for a long time what to do a bunch of videos on Calvinism. And that will be coming. So, But I want to talk about one of the things that he mentioned that I think a lot of Calvinists would go to. And that is Exodus when God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And so I want to help you understand this. I think that God has revealed this to me. And I think that it's really easy to understand. And in Exodus 9, uh, Exodus 9, 12, it says, And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had spoken to Moses. So the Lord said to Moses that Pharaoh's heart would be hardened. And so what does this all mean? How do we understand this? Okay, if God was saying that, Pharaoh needs to let his people go, right? And Pharaoh would say no. So then God would have Moses do these miracles and stuff and then go back to Pharaoh. It's like, okay, you're going to let him go now? And he's like, no. So we do like more miracles, plagues and stuff. And um, so right before this verse, you know, uh, verse 10, 11, God had Moses do this miracle where these this this uh, boils broke out, right? Boils broke out on these magicians of the Pharaoh. Uh, blisters and whatnot. So, uh, so he had this miracle, 
where blisters broke out on the magicians of Pharaoh, and then Pharaoh's heart was hardened as God told Moses that it would be. And uh, so what this means is the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. It means that the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh indirectly because he did these, uh, this miracle, this plague, and the result of that was that, hard, that Pharaoh hardened his heart. Okay, Pharaoh didn't have to harden his heart. Pharaoh could have said, okay, okay, I'm going to let Israel go now. Okay, but no, he chose to react by hardening his heart. God acted, and then Pharaoh reacted by hardening his heart. Okay, that's what happened. Um, so I tried to think about a bunch of examples. I mean, I'm not really sure. Let's just say that there's a kid arguing with a parent. They want to go on a date or they want to go to a party. And the parent says no. Okay. And so the parent says no. And at that point, we could say that the parent hardened the kid's heart. <laughs> or... We say, okay, so the kid says, so the kid gets upset, so then he breaks something of the parents. So he breaks something of the parents, and now the parents' heart is hardened. Now now the parent hardens their heart even harder, okay? Now not only are you not going to go, now you're grounded or whatever else, you know, right? So, so we could say that when the kid broke the stuff or whatever, the kid hardened the parents' heart. But really, you know, it's the parents choice it's a person's choice okay or i was thinking maybe like a brother or sister getting a fight or something you know and the brother would hit his sister or something and he'd be like she made me do it you know she made me angry um you know but you know because you got upset or whatever that doesn't give any excuse to do that or whatever okay but the calvinists they want to interpret this this is how a calvinist interprets this verse the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. And they say that this means that God sovereignly, against Pharaoh's will, hardened his heart. And so we have God saying that he wants Pharaoh to let his people go. But then God sovereignly, against his will, against Pharaoh's will, hardens his heart so he won't let the people go. So this is how the Calvinists interpret things all over the place is that we have God contradicting himself. God, you know, God says he wants Pharaoh to let people go, but then God makes it to where Pharaoh won't let his people go. So God's playing these games, and he's mocking people, and he's doing all kinds of messed up stuff. And then when you ask them about that, they're like, well, God's just God, and we can't really question him, and uh, it's all according to his good will, and these are mysteries we won't ever completely understand. But let me tell you something. We can understand that Calvinism is completely wrong from the Bible. Okay, over and over again, there are so many passages that refute Calvinism and the whole tulip that system, okay, except for maybe the P, the perseverance of the saints, but the rest of it, it's totally refuted from Scripture, okay? And this guy and many others, John MacArthur as well, a lot of them, they might be four-point Calvinists, where I think that they'll uh, reject the idea of limited atonement. But, uh, which means that Christ only died for the elect, pretty much. Um, so they'll say, no, Christ died for all, but yet they'll still hold to, uh, unconditional election. So before the, the foundation of the earth, God chose who would be saved and chose who would be lost. Christ died for all. But God uh, still chose who was going to be saved and who wasn't. It doesn't even make any sense. Okay, so uh, four-point Calvinists are Calvinists. Five-point Calvinists are Calvinists. In fact, I think that the five-point Calvinists are some of the most honest ones. Okay, they, they'll, they actually are honest about what they believe and stuff. Um, but the four-pointers, they're going to try to say those are extreme Calvinists and we're we're uh, reasonable, we're biblical, or whatever. No, none of that's biblical. All right, Calvinism is from hell. All right, Calvinism is from the devil. And uh, I talked to this guy, and I said this isn't something that we should separate over or whatever. But I disagree. It's a big deal to me. 
Calvinism completely destroys scripture just like easy believism destroys scripture. Okay? The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh because the Lord did plagues and Pharaoh chose to harden his heart. Okay? And people might say, well, what about foreknowledge? And how does that all work? If God knew that if he did these plagues, that Pharaoh was going to harden his heart, then why did he do it? Is this still somehow God's being in control of all these things? Well, the thing is that uh, that doesn't deny free will. Okay, Just because God knows if he does something that someone else is going to react a certain way, that doesn't mean that that person had to react that way. Okay, We still have free will intact with God's foreknowledge. It doesn't contradict. Okay, That's how we need to understand Scripture, too, is free will has to be intact. And I want to say something that, uh, you know, just like all kinds of false doctrines, like easy believism or anything else, they'll, they'll have their verses that might sound convincing. So this Lord hardening Pharaoh's heart could be one of them with the Calvinists. And there might be others, you know, in Romans or whatever. That they might point you to and you might say, oh, that, that does sound convincing. But there are so many scriptures that reject Calvinism, okay? The Lord died for all, okay? God so loved the world, not the elect. Calvinism goes against the plain, plain reading and teaching of scripture. So, don't get cu caught up on one verse. You know, you need to, to get well aware of what the Bible teaches. Read through the entire Bible. And, uh, you know, just like easy believism. You know, if somebody would say that, you know, my yoke is easy or whatever. You know, well, well, rich men, they hardly enter the kingdom of heaven. So it's not easy for them. So you need to know this. You know, realize there's many other verses that refute these things false teachings they'll try to point you to one verse and, and but you have to take all scripture in context in its entirety right but uh so i hope you understand that when the lord hardened pharaoh's heart what it means is that indirectly because the lord did something this is how pharaoh reacted to it okay <laughs> that's that's what that means it doesn't mean that God sovereignly against Pharaoh's will changed his heart. Okay. And then and then God, you know, says one thing, but then he does another. And all this nonsense. You know, I just like again, I can't believe a Calvinist will just say, Well, we can't understand and no, we can't understand that Calvinism is wrong. Period. And so I'll be going over probably other other arguments that he brought up last night and things that we need to know about Calvinism. So there's, there's a lot of work in that area. But I'm, I hope at least in the next year that we're all going to understand Calvinism very, very well. We're going to understand what the Bible teaches very, very well, which is not Calvinism. And we're going to cover every verse that the Calvinists will use. And we're going to really understand this. So if you ever come across a Calvinist, you are going to be so prepared to just ch tear that system down, tear that stronghold of satanic Calvinism down. So, thanks for watching. God bless. Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven.